So now that you understand how a neuron works, we're going to now talk about how muscles work. And you remember that whole depolarization, repolarization thing, right? Yeah. Maybe I don't want to correct the exams till Sunday. No, I have to watch football on Sunday, so I will be correcting your exams before that. So, again, to recap, depolarization, repolarization. Give me a summary. What happens? That's good. good. Nice visual. Um, nerve impulse happens because of what? Neurotransmitters release, it comes in contact with receptor, then what happens? Sodium rushes in, causes what to happen? Ooh, how come? Okay, so let's 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 talk about why sodium causes depolarization to happen because it changes the the charge within the cell, and that charge eventually will flow over to the voltage gated channels on the which membrane? What part of the cell? The axon, and that's going to cause a whole bunch of voltage gated channels to start opening in series and depolarization will happen. Yes? Okay, good. Because keep that in mind because it's kind of the same thing going on, a little bit different with respect to the molecules that are involved when we talk about muscle physiology and muscle contraction. So, First thing the book talks about are the different types of muscle. And this is review. Yeah, who needs to sign the, what's this? This little front group. Um, what kind of muscle is there? Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Where do we find skeletal muscle? Exactly, associated with the skeleton. When we think skeletal muscle, we think moving our skeleton. <clears throat> a couple of things we have to remember about skeletal muscle. We call it the voluntary muscle. And what's that mean? We have, we control everything, but uh, conscious control over this group of, because who innervates muscles? Who causes muscles to contract? The nervous system, right? What portion of the nervous system? The peripheral. What portion of the peripheral nervous system? Somatic. Very good. Yes. So good, you got that right on the test. Cardiac muscle. Oh, another thing about skeletal muscle, because of the arrangements of the proteins that we're going to talk about in a moment, we also call skeletal muscle striated. And we're going to talk about why in a minute. So those are some of the terms we have to remember with respect to skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle, also striated. But is it voluntary? Can I, do I sit here and go, okay, beat. Even if I did, it wouldn't listen. Because it's what? It's involuntary. Who takes care of it? Say it loud. The autonomic division of the peripheral nervous system, right? Automatic. We don't have to think about it. It's also striated when we look at it under the microscope because it has similar arrangement to what we're going to see in the skeletal muscle of those proteins. The other muscle, smooth muscle, also involuntary. I ate my breakfast this morning. Do I have to think about pushing it through uh, 
the esophagus, the stomach, 21 feet of small intestine, and about 10 to 12 feet of large intestine. Gosh, I'd be very busy, wouldn't I? So involuntary as well. Do we see under the microscope the same thing in smooth muscle as we do in cardiac and skeletal muscle? You just had a test on tissue, so the answer to that is what? No, we don't see what? Striation, so it's non-striated. So these are some of the terms we have to remember for the different types of muscle. Remu muscle special characteristics are that it is excitable. You know, you tell it we're going to grandma's, it gets all excited. What's excitable mean? The system we just discussed was excitable as well. Yeah, some sort of stimulus causes change to happen, radical change within the cell. So it's excitable. And because of that, it is also responsive. So responsiveness is also a term we use. It can shorten or contract, so we call it contractile. It can lengthen or stretch, so it's also extensible. <laughs> and then it's got a lot of give, so it has elasticity. So all of those terms are used to describe muscle tissue. So what's it for? Why do we need muscles? Produce movement, to move things, to move things, to move us. Because we can't just stick our feet in the ground and suck all the nutrients we need out of it and stay put. We have to move through our environment. So producing movement is extremely important. In order to maintain homeostasis throughout our body, sometimes we need to maintain a certain posture. So it helps us maintain position. For example, me standing up here talking to you, I'm doing a lot of work right now, believe it or not. What am I doing? With respect to the muscular system, I have to contract a whole bunch of muscles in my lower limbs how about in my neck and in my head and in my back? Just to stand here takes a lot of work and effort with respect to the muscular system. So maintaining posture, body position, also a very important part of a muscle's job. Stabilizing movements at the joints. We talked about all those joint movements, adduction, adduction, plantar flexion, yada, yada, yada. So who's going to help stabilize those movements? Football players understand the importance of stabilizing their joints when some giant linebacker guy comes and hits them in the knees. Linebackers do that, right? Am I, am I getting that right? Okay. I like football. I'm learning. So they understand how important it is to stabilize joints because this knee joint was meant to do what? That way. That's it. Not that way or that way, this way. Yes? And when it goes that way or this way, that can cause some problems for us. Correct? So joint stabilization is a very important job of the muscular system as well. Believe it or not, one of the important jobs of the muscular system is to generate heat. One of the waste products of muscle contraction is heat. Why is that important? Because we have to maintain a certain temperature, right? So our chemical reactions can happen as they need to. What, what kind of organism are we? We're called warm-blooded organisms. So we need to maintain a certain core body temperature in order for all of our parts to work right. If it gets too cold, everything slows way down. Or if it gets too hot, everything starts to fall apart. So one of the jobs of the muscular system is to produce some of the heat necessary to main core, maintain core body temperature. Example of this, you take a little nappy on Sunday, yes? Some of us take a nappy on Sunday. We enjoy our little Sunday nappies. 
Anybody? Am I the only one? Actually, I don't nap on Sundays, but I used to, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> so everybody else is running around the house, and you have your little nappy going on on Sunday. So you get up, and you are, geez, it's cold in here, right? Boy, can we turn some heat on? Everybody else is like, that house is fine. Why are you cold when everybody else is fine? Yeah, you didn't do as much muscular movement as the rest of the house while you were doing your little nappy time, right? So you don't have that extra heat produced by your muscular contractions. When you're cold, what do you do? You shiver, so you uncontrollably, well, kind of controllably, because the nervous system is telling you to do that, contract a whole bunch of different muscle groups to produce heat to bring up that temperature for you. So some of the other things, what else do muscles do? Well, they control, believe it or not, how much light goes into your eye. You know that colored part of your eye? I happen to have brown ones. Some of you have blue ones. Some of you have green ones. What is that called? The iris. Yep. You can work out your eye muscles um, to help you accommodate better, to help you get your eye coordination together. It's not going to make your vision better because do muscles send messages to your brain for vision? No. What do they do? Yeah, they coordinate those eyes. So when light comes and hits on an object and then reflects back into your eye, you have to be able to move your eyes to that place so we can get that reflection coming in. And that's a coordinated movement because your individual, you have two eyes, correct? you have what we call binocular vision. We'll talk all about this um, second semester when we hit special senses. But it's important to coordinate those eye movements just right so that light comes and bounces in and then gets to the place where it can stimulate the receptors for sight. The receptors for sight are called what? You know this. They're rods and cones, but what kind of receptors are they? Photoreceptors, right? So they're going to be stimulated by light waves. So all of these other things, the eyeball, all the muscles, and all of those things, accessory organs for vision, are going to help get those light waves to where they need to be. So if, if your muscles are off with your eyes, for example, that's going to affect your vision because your eyes won't work in a coordinated way to get that stimulus in for processing. So that can, that can affect your vision indirectly. That was a way long answer to your question, wasn't it? Hopefully it answered your question. Did it answer your question? OK, good. Did somebody hand question something? No? Just scratch on your back? Good. All right, so gross anatomy. Not because it's disgusting, but it's big. We're looking at a muscle. This should look kind of familiar to you, doesn't it? Remind you of something you just studied. What? A nerve. So a muscle is just like a nerve. It's a whole bunch of muscle fibers. And this is the confusing terminology in this chapter. When you looked under the microscope at skeletal muscle, it reminds me of big, long telephone poles. I don't know why telephone poles comes to mind, but that's what I think of. The cells are very, very long. You couldn't even get one under the microscope. Did you know that? When you looked at those under the microscope, you were looking only at a portion of, of a few cells because they're so long. Just like when you looked at the nervous system, when you looked at a neuron, did you see the whole cell? No, you only saw what? Yeah, you saw the cell body, the nucleus, and you saw maybe a couple of fibers coming in and out, but they're way too big. Ooh, <laughs> I'm awake. Um, so skeletal muscle cells are very long and they're referred to as fibers. 
The confusing part is there are fibers inside the muscle cell. We don't call them fibers. We call them myo, for muscle, fibrils. Okay? So as you're reading, don't get confused because they're going to refer to the cell as a muscle fiber. They're going to refer to the fibers inside the cell as myofibrils. Make sense? Kind of? Nobody's going to give me any feedback today. So we have a whole bunch of cells grouped together, very similar to what we saw in the nerve. We also have a food source. So what we're going to find in any muscle group are arteries and veins. Blood and nerve supply, extremely important for muscle groups because what does the nervous system do for a muscle? Yeah, it's going to cause the change. It's going to cause them to be reactive and contractile and all of that stuff. So when we look at any given muscle, and it, anybody have a steak for dinner last night? Mm, was it good? Did you kind of, huh? It was moose steak. It was moose steak. Ooh, how do you make a moose steak? Do you marinate it or just like throw it on the grill? Because <laughs> that's all we had. Yeah. Yeah, because it's so it's so lean. When we look at some of the, the the meat, and not to gross any of you out, but now you'll analyze your steak a little bit more. But game is much more lean than the lovely big giant fat cows that we eat from Hannaford and they have a lot more fat so when you cook something with less fat you have to be careful not to do what Dr well dry it out overcook it because when you cook the nice fat cow from Hannaford as you cook it the fat releases and causes the meat to be moist so when we look at a steak and that's kind of what we're looking at when we look at a muscle, we see those groups very similar to what we saw in the nervous system. And then what we'll see throughout it is little pockets of fat. So when you buy a steak, does anybody know how to buy a good steak? Yeah, they call it marbling. That, the white rings through it. What's those? What are those? It's fat. And that's exactly, that's going to keep in a living muscle, what's it going to do for it? Feed it, exactly. It provides with energy. When we talk about um, cellular respiration and producing energy next semester, we're going to see that fat can also do that for us besides carbohydrates. And then as a matter of fact, muscles sort of like using fat to produce their energy. They're going to need a lot of energy to do the work that they do. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we have muscle. When we look at it under the microscope, we're going to kind of see the same thing we saw when we looked at the cross section of a nerve. And you guys, if you haven't done it yet, you'll do it this week. So when we look at and look at both cross section and longitudinal section, you're going to see different things. When we look at the cross section of a muscle, we're going to be looking at almost the same thing we saw when we looked at the cross section of a neuron. Those little axons, like little circles, what do you think these are? Remember my telephone pole? Okay, now take a whole bunch of telephone poles like this, turn them this way and look inside. What do you see? See the ends of the telephone poles? What you're looking at here is the cells. Yes? So cross section. What if I cut it this way? And that's what you guys looked at when you did your tissues. You looked at what? You looked at the longitudinal section. So you could you cut through the middle of those telephone poles and you were looking at all the little stripes created by the myofibrils. Okay? So same terms, except now instead of what, we have what? What was the outside wrapping of a neuron? Epineurium. What's a outside wrapping of a muscle called? Yeah, same terms. I'm not going to go through them. You got it, right? So epimesium, 
I mean, excuse me. Yeah, epimecium, perimecium, they're going to be around the what? And we have the same kind of little groupings here. Remember how I described the box of straws? Same thing. They're called fascicles. What covers a fascicle? The perimecium. And the endomecium is going to cover, yeah, between all the little cells to separate them. And this is one muscle cell. Again, what are we calling it? A muscle fiber. So see all the little circles inside? What are those? The myofibrils. Okay? So same terms that we learned, except now we're putting mecium on the end. So you should know those. Yes? So let's pull out a muscle cell and have a look at the microscopic anatomy of a skeletal muscle fiber. Again, we're calling the cell a muscle fiber because what does it look like? A big, long fiber. You know, sometimes, um, I'm trying to think of when you'd get that effect. It's mostly blood vessels. But if you're, you're making chicken, sometimes you can see some of the different groups. Steak is the best because they have a nice cross-section cut, and you can see those little groups in your steak. You can see some of the wrappings around some of the different um, groups of muscles. Correct. So you have to kind of go with the grain. If you go against all of those groups, it's going to be hard to cut. Kind of like when you cut wood, right? If you go against where all the little fibers are, are lining up, groups of cells like the growth rings, for example, it's going to be rough to cut. So when we pull out one muscle cell, this is a diagram of a muscle fiber. And the outside wrapping of the cell its plasma membrane is called the what? Yeah, the sarcolemma. So that's the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. What are all those purple, what's this? How come it has more than one? Yeah, because it's so long. Skeletal muscle cells are one of the very few groups of cells in our bodies that are multinucleated. So we're going to see several nuclei in any given muscle fiber. So we have a sarcoplasm that flows through it. What's that? That's just like the what? Mm -hmm. Just like the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. We have glycosomes. What the heck are those? Glyco, glyco, glyco. Kind of sounds like sugary, doesn't it? Glucose, glyco, glyco. I've heard a word. Glycogen. What is that? It's the stored form of sugar. What do I need sugar for? Energy. Energy to do work. Again, we're going to talk about that work in a moment. So we have a different sources of energy, all kind of there for easy access for muscle contractions. We also need a lot of oxygen to carry on the reaction of cellular respiration to give us the energy we need to do our work. Remember, I'm just standing here, right? Am I working? Yes. So even though I'm not consuming, and even though I'm not you know, building up a sweat, your muscles are constantly working, and they constantly need that energy source. So in order for me to make lots of energy, we'll describe second semester when we talk about cellular respiration, chapter 25. You'll love it. We're going to talk about oxygen's role in producing all of that energy. Energy in the form of what? ATP. So we have to make a lot of ATP molecules. So we have pigments very similar to hemoglobin called myoglobin. And why do you think we call it myoglobin? Because it's in the muscles that are going to help with carrying and releasing oxygen 
for cellular respiration, for making energy. It's the reason why your steak is what? Red. Yes. Why red? That's the color of the molecule. Why are red blood cells red? They're full of another molecule, very similar to myoglobin, called hemoglobin. And we call it hemoglobin because it's in what? Blood. Huh. Crazy, isn't it? So myoglobin is a very important pigment, a very important molecule for oxygen carrying capacity. Again, we need a lot of oxy oxygen, excuse me, because we need to make a lot of energy in muscles to keep them going. The other thing we're going to find lots of is mitochondria. What the heck do we need a lot of mitochondria for? Yeah, this is where I make most of my ATP. Again, when we talk about the reaction next semester, we're going to see most of the ATP molecules are going to be put together in the mitochondria. When we talked about the cell and we talked about that organelle, what do we call it? See, this is an example of questions that are going to be on your final. And I notice you guys are answering a lot of them. So I don't, I don't want you to panic about the final. That's just an aside. Because you know a lot of this stuff. What do we call the mitochondria? The powerhouse of the cell. Why? That's where most of the ATP is produced. OK? So we see a lot of that in this cell. And then we have, of course, our friends, the myofibrils. And they are composed of proteins that are going to allow this cell to be reactive or contractile, shorten and lengthen. And they are very, very organized and lined up very, very well. And because of the way they line up and are very organized, don't they look like they have created some sort of stripes? This is why your cells, when you look at them under the microscopes, are what? Striated. Because of the organization of the myofibrils. Now go back. Lots of them in there, yes? It's jam-packed with myofibrils. Anybody work out like me? Today was a weight day. Do I make more muscles? No. No, as a matter of fact, this is kind of follows the same rule as the nervous system. You got the muscles you got. That's it. Well, how the heck? Can that be? Because when I go to the gym and I lift up those heavy weights, I make my, my arm gets bigger. Yes? You saw the picture of me before. How'd that happen? If I didn't make more cells, what did I make more of? Those myofibrils. So as I, as I cause my muscles to work harder and lift heavier weight, I'm going to create more myofibrils within the cell to accommodate that load. So I need to apply more force for that load. And that's what you do when you build up your muscles. What happens when you stop going to the gym and you stop lifting those heavy weights? Do your muscles die? Well, sometimes if you don't use it, you lose some of them. But what happens to the cell? Yeah, it doesn't have as many myofibrils anymore. It doesn't have to accommodate that heavy load. So that's what you do when you go to the gym, OK? So those stripes are created by the way these proteins, very organized, line up in the myofibrils. They create little units called sarcomeres. And there's tons and tons of little sarcomeres stuck together to create a myofibril. Now, I know you're going to hate me for this, but you're going to have to know what these stripes are created by. So when you look on page 281 in your textbook, under the section that says striations, sarcomeres, myofibrils, 
you're going to have to know what an I band is, what an A band is, what an M line is, what a Z disc is, what an H zone is. So the two major proteins that we talk about when we talk about myofibrils that create these stripes, these proteins are called myosin and actin. Sometimes we hear them referred to as thick filaments and thin filaments. And they're going to line up very organized to create the sarcomere. So the sarcomere blown up <coughs> is a combination of thick filaments, thin filaments, and then little proteins that kind of hold them all together. When I think of these little proteins, I think of springs, bed springs. These little proteins here are called titan. And they're going to help hold together these little sarcomere units. The thick filament, or myosin, is made up of a bunch of myosin molecules. Anybody golf? Yeah, I'm going to try and take that up this summer. Really excited about that. So think of a golf club, little head. Now take a whole bag of golf clubs, grab them at the shaft, hold them together. That's what a myosin thick filament is like. So a whole bunch of myosin molecules, a whole bunch of golf clubs held together in a bunch. <clears throat> and you can see the little golf club heads kind of stick out here in the large thick filament. The thin filament is sort of like a strand of pearls. Each little bead is an actin molecule. We tie a whole bunch of them together and twist them to create the thin filament. Then we have a special M protein, and I used to know the name of it, and I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. You can Google that up. But there's a protein that holds two of those bags of golf clubs together to create a whole thick filament. From one Z disc to the next Z disc, we have a unit. And that unit is called the sarcomere. Yes? Again, Titan holds these little units together, like little bungee cords or springs. And they line up to create these stripes. So here we see the thick filament. Here we see, what's this? That protein that's holding the two together. What's that? That's the M line. But it also creates a little light stripe called the H zone. Because at rest, when the muscle is at rest, it looks like this. Guess what happens to this area when the muscle contracts? It disappears. What we're going to see is those thick filaments pull together. And what happens to the H zone? it's going to disappear. So these little thin filaments get pulled together and the H zone will disappear. So when the sarcomere shortens, the H zone disappears. Z disc to Z disc forms from one sarcomere to the next this light area called the I band. So what do we have in the I band? Just thin filaments. In the A band, what do we have? We had, it's darker because what? We have an overlap of thick and thin filaments, so it's dark. So we see I band on either side. Right in the center of an I band is the what? The Z disc. So in an I band, we, it actually is the end of one sarcomere and the beginning of the next sarcomere. Hmm? Say it again. Myo. Myomesium? Mesium? Mesium? Yeah, that's the protein in the M line. That's why they call it M. 
Okay? So know what's an a, what an A band is, know what an I band is, know what a Z disc is, know what an M line is, know what an H zone is, understand what a sarcomere is. That's not really bad. Look at the picture. Yes? So the sarcomere then is extremely important when we talk about muscle contraction. Again, everything on page 281 is nice and outlined for you. The next thing they talk about on page 81 is the molecular composition of the myofilaments. So when we go down deeper and look at this sarcomere and look at the molecules associated with these thick and thin filaments, they're not the only ones present. There's more. So if we take a super high microscope look at the thin filaments, for example, we're going to see that there's more proteins associated with these. There's more associated with this grouping. The other proteins associated with the thin filament are called tropomyosin and troponin. Now here's how I remember it. Tropomyosin is a long word, yes? So what's the long, thin protein? Tropomyosin. Troponin, shorter word. Troponin is a smaller protein. There's these little black dots on those, that chain of pearls I discussed, that actin molecule. And that is a very important component of a muscle contraction. That portion of the actin molecule is the active site for myosin attachment. Myosin is very highly attracted to it. Do you ever get two really strong magnets? When they get too close together, what do they do? Whoosh, they suck together, right? That portion of the actin molecule is very highly attractive to the myosin heads. And over there, we see a picture of what myosin looks like up close and personal. So if we look at the thin filament, we actually see that when the muscle is at rest, when it's long and not short, tropomyosin covers what? Don't block in that little active site on the actin molecule. It blocks the active site for myosin. So myosin can't hook up with it because that site is blocked by tropomyosin. These are what we call regulatory proteins in a muscle contraction. We see elastic fibers here as well, and that's what titan is, kind of like those little springs that hold everything together. It's actually going to change and pull it out of the way. So what happens during a muscle contraction, and I'll go through the whole thing, troponin is sort of like hands that are holding on to those long strands of tropomyosin. During any chemical reaction, when chemicals react, they cause a change in shape. So when we have a chemical reaction here to cause a muscle contraction, calcium ions come in contact with troponin molecules and cause them to change shape. When they change shape, they pull on what? They pull on those tropon tropomyosin strands and pull them out of the way, exposing what? Those binding sites for myosin. Guess what myosin does? grabs on and pulls. That's called a power stroke. When myosin grabs on and pulls, what happens to the sarcomere? Actin's going to move towards the what? The center and cross over. And what's going to happen to the sarcomere? It's going to shorten. What happens to the muscle? It contracts. It shortens. So it's a series of chemical reactions that cause 
that event to occur. And those tropin and tropomycin regulatory proteins are important in the whole shortening of the sarcomere. The mice and heads, again, are going to be able to hold on to energy from ATP to help them with this whole movement. So muscle contraction takes a lot of ATP to happen. Okay, table 283 on page, uh, no, um, excuse me, page 283, table 9.1, shows us a nice visual of the structure and organization of muscle. So that's going to help you um, keep that all together. When we go and we have a look inside the muscle cell, we're going to see all the same kind of parts we saw when we discussed cells in general. One of those parts that's going to play a big role in helping with muscle contraction is the endoplasmic reticulum inside a muscle cell. And guess what we call the endoplasmic reticulum inside a muscle cell? Boy, you guys are answering my questions so fast, I can't even drink my coffee today. I'm so excited. It's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we see them here in blue in this diagram. <clears throat> and they're sort of organized in little groups surrounding all of those little myofibrils. They're actually going to play a big role in helping with the chemical changes that cause muscle contraction. These little groups with something that goes sort of downwards, what do we call this in direction? Vertical, and this is horizontal. The endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum are horizontal, and these little tubules that connect everything called T tubules go vertical to create these little units that surround all of the myofibrils called the triad. There's a portion very close to the T-tubule of the sarcoplasmic reticulum <coughs> we call the terminal cisterni. And that's just basically the part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, SR, that's right beside the what? T-tubule. Yes? And these little triads are going to help with the chemistry related to muscle contraction. We can see those myofibrils organized all around, and of course, mitochondria, which is necessary for what? Making all the ATP I need for this. Please notice, I didn't point this out, but I, oh, where did it go? Okay, never mind. Maybe it's in your book and not in my diagram. Oh, yeah. Look on page 280. When you look at the bottom of this diagram, figure 9.2, we see um, little circles with different dots in them. Basically, when we look inside a myofibril, we see that last dot there combination of what? <coughs> myosin and actin. So we see a combination of myosin and actin when we cut through those myofibrils. The pictures here are going to help you understand things a lot more when we talk about the actual chemistry and the physiology of muscle contraction. The actual chemistry and physiology of muscle, muscle contraction is called the sliding filament model or the sliding filament theory. And basically what happens during muscle contraction is we are going to change the stripes in those cells because we are going to change the orientation of the sarcomeres. So when I look at the top part of the diagram, and this is on page 285 in your textbook, I see a muscle at rest. Do you see the stripes? Okay. So we see the Z line there and there, and then we see the what? Where do we cross over from Z line to C line? It's kind of light. What do we call that? 
Do you see the I band? Where do we cross over thick and thin filaments? It gets dark. What do we call that? That's called the A. That gets light again. That's the H. What's hanging right in the middle? That myo whatever the heck protein it was holding the mice and heads together. That's the M line. Okay. What happens when the muscle contracts? Do we have an H zone anymore? No. What happened to it? Yeah, it, it's in here somewhere. We don't see it anymore because what? That A band did what? It shortened. How did it do that? Does anybody know? Any second offenders in here? You know. What happened? Okay, I'll tell you what happened. Correct. Myosin pulled on actin, pulled it towards the center. Everybody shortened. We changed the stripes. So when we look at a muscle contracting, if we can look at it under the microscope, we see very different stripes. Fully contracted sarcomere of a muscle fiber. Because the whole sarcomere is going to shorten. That H zone is going to disappear. All right. One of the things, one of, I like this book a lot, but one of the things I don't like about this book is this chapter. Because it's a little repetitive, confusing, scattered. Okay? So, what we're going to try to do is organize it a little bit for us. So, we want to look at something called the sliding filament model. And this is the physiology of muscle contraction. In order for a muscle to contract, we have to cause a chemical change within the cell. And who's going to be responsible for that? Mm -hmm. The nervous system. So when we look at phase one, the beginning part, muscles just hanging out, got nice big sarcomeres, got an H zone, just relaxing, chilling. Somebody comes along and changes that. Well, who's to come along and change that nervous system? Where a neuron meets, and the, be and the best thing to look at when I describe this, if you have your textbook, is page number 287, figure 9.8. Where a neuron meets a muscle cell, we call that the neuromuscular junction. And just like we talked about when we talked about the nervous system, there's a space between the end of the axon, which is, what do we call the ends of the axons? The axon terminals. And of course, these are going to cause movement, so what do we call these type of neurons? Motor neurons. Sometimes you'll see them referred to as motor end plate or motor units because it's a motor neuron that's causing this whole thing to happen. Okay? So, we see the axon terminal of a motor neuron. It meets, does it stick to? Do, does a neuron like stick to the muscle? No, it's, there's a what between it? There's a synapse, there's a gap. Same terms we talked about when we talked about the nervous system. So the gap has to be bridged by some sort of chemical that's going to cause a change. Now, what was the chemical that caused a change from one neuron to the next neuron called? This one is acetylcholine, but what's that called? What is acetylcholine? It's a neurotransmitter. Same thing has, is going to come into play when we talk about muscle contraction. So some sort of nerve impulse takes place, information that I have to move a muscle is coming from where? I talk with my hands, if you haven't noticed. I usually smack things. This morning I was on the treadmill and I was talking with my hands and I hit that stupid little magnet thing. 
<laughs> the whole treadmill just stopped. I almost went. It was horrible. But who tells my muscles to contract? Specific. Which portion of the nervous system tells my muscles? The somatic division of the peripheral nervous system, correct? Motor. So, nerve impulse takes place. We release neurotransmitter. ACH, release, binds to receptors on the sarcolemma. What the heck is the sarcolemma? The plasma membrane of a muscle cell. Just like the little receptors we found on the dendrites of a neuron, the receptors are very similar on the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. And when that neurotransmitter comes in contact with it, what's going to happen? Open up. Who's going to rush in? Same ion. Sodium. Ion permeability of sarcolemma changes. So now, remember, cells at rest, where is there more sodium? On the outside then, the inside. That creates, what, what's that called? Who? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's a differential concentration gradient. It sets up the what? MP, membrane. membrane potential, right? Which is what? Oh my God. <sighs> I better have a drink. Or, or just give me a general. You don't have to give me the numbers, but what's the charge associated with a membrane at rest? Positive on the outside, negative on the inside. That's called resting membrane potential. This is going to disrupt that. So ion permeability of the sarcolemma changes. Sodium rushes in to change what? Membrane potential. That change in charge, local change in membrane voltage, is going to cause a series of chemical reactions, very similar, same terms, called depolarization. Local depolarization at the end plate where the two meet ignites AP in sarcolemma. What's AP? Action potential. Very good. So the wave of change is then going to occur within the cell, just like it did in the nerve cell. Now we're talking muscle cell. Action potential is going to travel across the sarcolemma. It's going to hitch a ride, and I kind of refer to these as um, water slides inside the cell. That change in charge, those sodium ions, are going to slide down the T-tubules. Remember the little triads we just talked about? And as that change in charge slides down the T-tubules, it's going to affect the little endoplasmic reticulum that's right up against it. That's called the terminal cisternae. And the SR, what's that again? Sarcoplasmic reticulum is going, and this is the, the, after the muscle contraction happens. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, the endoplasmic reticulum inside the cell, is going to release what? calcium ions. So as those little sodium ions take a ride down the T-tubules, they're going to open up these little calcium gates on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium is going to flood into the area and bind with, remember troponin? Hanging out, holding those little tropomyosins. When calcium binds to troponin, they're going to do what? Change shape. And they're going to expose what? Those little binding sites for actin. Well, myosin has been waiting very patiently, holding on to some energy so that I can reach up and grab onto that binding site and pull it towards the center of the sarcomere. 
So the next thing that happens is myosin heads bind to actin and shorten the sarcomere and muscle contraction begins. Each muscle cell can only do this. Ready? That's it. So why is it I can do this and this? Exactly. So when I look at the different muscles, I'm going to see muscle fibers going in many different directions. Why do you think the muscle cells inside your heart are branched? Exactly. So I can create this movement. If everything was going in the same direction, it wouldn't work very well. So that's the basis of the sliding filament theory. This diagram is nice because it walks through it for you. But you know what's even nicer? I'm going to show you a little something today. You have this tool right in your hands. I'm going to go and show you how to get there. Does anybody know where I'm going? Mastering ain't. Ooh, look at those cool crocs. Little yuppie looking, but. For those of you who don't use your mastering, shame, shame, you should be doing your mastering lab homework, correct? So, for those of you who have not yet enjoyed mastering and the help mastering can give you, I highly suggest you go in there and use this, okay, because this is going to make you understand the sliding filament theory. So I go to study area, and then I go way over here, and I go to what? Interactive physiology. This is going to be one of your best buddies and best friends second semester. This semester, hopefully you use it for nervous system. I hope you'll use it for muscular system. But you'll use it a lot more then. Also, look at this. Did you know you had that in your fingertips? Who uses them? Helpful? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you download it. You can listen to it. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I want to go there to the interactive physiology modules. And this is the muscular system. So there's different, different um, discussions. You can go over an anatomy review, neuromuscular junction. I want to look at this one right now. It's called the sliding filament theory. And hopefully this works. I can stand up here and do all my stuff, but this is going to make you remember. The current theory of how a muscle cell contracts is the sliding filament theory, which states that the contraction of a muscle cell occurs as the thin filaments slide past the thick filaments. During contraction, the sarcomere shortens and the thin and thick filaments overlap to a greater degree. How do you go to the next page? Okay, so see down here, you just click on this and you go to the next page. Do you see why this is going to be helpful to you? Do you ever get to that point where if I read another line in the book, I'm going to puke? Yeah. Right? Or you start reading the same line over and over and over, right? So it's like, okay, I'm done with this. You don't have to read. She'll read for you. You can listen. You can watch the little pictures. Anybody have kids at home? The? Oh, the poor kids. I'm so sorry. Yeah, because that that's a way for this to sink in. Listen. <laughs> but guess what? You're teaching them anatomy and physiology, too. I didn't realize it until my, because when I was, when I started teaching, a few years ago, my kids were very small. They're not very small anymore. But I would, when I had to work, when I had to make it up, up an exam, when I had to do something, you know, they wanted to be kept busy. 
So I would give them anatomy diagrams, terrible mother, and crayons, seriously. And they would draw and they would do this. Or when these started to come out, I would let them listen to it. They're awesome now, 20 and 22. You can ask them any anatomy question. They're, they're pretty good at it. And they didn't even take, well, my daughter did, but it just came because they heard it when they were little. Little minds have little sponge brains, yes? You want to teach anything to somebody, do it when they're young. Ask an old person. They'll tell you, right? The sponge gets a little crusty when we get old, <laughs> right? It's a little harder to break through. So watch these. Oh, where did it go? Oh, there we go. Your goals for learning are to explore the molecular structure and functional features of the thin and thick filaments to understand yeah, the sequence of events. The, on yourself. the sliding filament theory of how a skeletal muscle contracts involves the activities of five different molecules plus calcium ions. The five molecules include myosin, actin, tropomyosin, troponin, and ATP. In addition to these five molecules, calcium ions are also involved in the process of muscle contraction. Now we will explore how each of these molecules participates in the contraction of a sarcomere. Click a thick filament to examine its structure. The other thing about this program is it's interactive. So you have to go click a thick filament. If you go click a thin filament, oh, I guess it'll go too. Um, it shouldn't have, but... The first molecule we will look at is the protein myosin. In skeletal muscle cells, the myosin molecules are bundled together to form the thick filaments. Click the thick filament to see an individual myosin molecule. So doesn't that look like a bag of golf clubs, all kind of? The shape of an individual myosin molecule is similar to a golf club with two heads. Myosin has several important functional features. The head, or cross bridge, has the ability to move back and forth. The flexing movement of the myosin head provides the power stroke for muscle contraction. Click the head of the myosin molecule to see it move. The other thing that's going to make you remember this stuff is this, believe it or not. You ready? <laughs> Seriously. The little noise, the, oh, that's funny. That makes you remember that. Wait till we get more sounds. It's even better. Come on. Do it. You can do it. No, oh, did we skip one? Don't do this to me now. This is the best part. Crap. What's it doing to me? So you can go scroll through the pages too, by the way. Let's try it this way. I don't know what it just did, but. It's broken. Huh? Does it? 
Let's see if I can come back into it. Come on, you shockwave. There we go. The shape of an individual myosin molecule is similar to a golf club with two heads. Myosin has several important functional Another feature of the myosin molecule is the hinge portion of the linear tail. This allows vertical movement so that the myosin head can bind to actin, the thin filament. Click the tail to see this movement. So here's the second thing it can do. The combination of these two hinge points allows for the necessary binding and power strokes of the cross bridges. Click anywhere on the myosin molecule to see both activities. I'll say it again. Yeah, it's like a you pulling something this way. <laughs> That's annoying, isn't it? Damn you. The cross bridge has two important binding sites. One site specifically binds ATP, adenosine triphosphate, a high energy molecule. Notice the position of the cross bridge. This is called the low energy conformation. Click the ATP molecule to see it bind to the cross bridge. So one of the important reasons for ATP is to change shape in this molecule and to give it energy. This is the reaction that happens after muscle contraction. In order for that contraction to release, energy needs to be present. So what am I clicking? The ATP molecule. Okay. The binding of ATP transfers energy to the myosin head as ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate. Click the ATP molecule to transfer energy to myosin. In order to use the energy from ATP, what do I have to do to it? I have to break it apart. ATP has potential energy. In order to create movement, kinetic energy, I have to break the molecule apart. And that's what hydrolysis, hydrolyzing ATP does. When I break it, I break off a phosphate and I turn it into what? ADP and phosphate. In order for me, in order for this guy who's now very weak because he reached up and grabbed and pulled and used all of his energy, in order for him to now lay back down, I have to let go of actin. What's going to cause me to let go of actin? When ATP binds, remember when chemical reactions happen, we change shape. So when ATP binds there, I'm going to cause the release and the relaxation. But in the meantime, I'm going to hold on to the energy from ATP for what? The next time I have to reach up and grab that actin molecule. Now the myosin head is in its high energy conformation. So even though it's in the relaxed position, it's in its what? High energy conformation because what? Now it's holding on to the energy that was released from the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP and phosphate. Now it's waiting for what to happen? Actin to become free again so we can use that energy to do what? grab up and pull the power stroke. The second binding site on the myosin head has a strong attraction for binding to actin, as we'll see later in the cross bridge cycling animation. Now that we've examined the structure of thick filaments, let's look more closely at thin filaments. Thin filaments are composed of three molecules, actin, tropomycin, and troponin. Click a thin filament to examine the arrangement of these three molecules. Actin is the major component of the thin filament. 
The actin portion of the thin filament is composed of actin subunits twisted into a double helical chain. Each actin subunit has a specific binding site to which the myosin head binds. So doesn't it look like a double strand of pearls that I kind of twisted? Each of those pearls is one actin, and a whole bunch of them put together is the thin filament. The regulatory protein, tropomyosin, is also part of the thin filament. Tropomyosin entwines around the actin. In the unstimulated muscle, the position of the tropomyosin covers the binding sites on the actin subunits and prevents myosin head binding. So when tropomyosin is in that relaxed conformation, myosin can't bind to actin because all those little binding sites are covered up. To expose the binding sites for binding with myosin, the tropomyosin molecule must be moved aside. This is facilitated by the presence of a third molecular complex called troponin. Troponin is attached and spaced periodically along the tropomyosin strand. Troponin by itself is not able to move the tropomyosin away from the binding sites. This process requires calcium ions. After an action potential, calcium ions are released from the terminal cisternae and bind to troponin. This causes a conformational change in the tropomyosin-troponin complex, dragging the tropomyosin strands off the binding sites. Click the terminal cisternae to release calcium ions and see this effect. Now what caused calcium to be released? Yeah, the sodium taking a ride down the T-tubules, right? Before seeing how all these components work together so go in a complete cross-bridge cycle, the five organic molecules and the calcium ions function together in a coordinated manner to cause the thin filament to slide past the thick filament. We will first show an animation of a single cross-bridge cycle and then describe this process step by step on the following pages. Sh to see the entire process of cross-bridge cycling, click the terminal cisternae. Just a little hint, there may be an essay question in your future that asks you the steps of a cross-bridge cycle. Yes? There's six of them, and where might you learn that from? what's to come in this wonderful little video. But this is the whole thing happening quick. You ready? Wanna say it again? Right, so now what this does is go through all the steps. As you've just seen, cross-bridge cycling is a continuous event. For the purposes of easier understanding, however, let's break it down into six separate steps. One, the influx of calcium triggering the exposure of binding sites on actin. Two, the binding of myosin to actin. Three, the power stroke of the myosin head that causes the sliding of the thin filaments. Four, the binding of ATP to the myosin head, which results in the myosin head disconnecting from actin. Five, the hydrolysis of ATP, which leads to the re-energizing and repositioning of the myosin head. Six, the transport of calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what happens if I don't have enough energy? What, if I, what happens if I can't make enough ATP? Your muscle stays. Can anybody ever get cramps when they're running? Use a lot of ATP, can't make enough. Myosin can't let go. 
Anybody ever hear of a, a, a toxin called botulina toxin? Botulism, yep, it's caused by the botulina toxin. What happens? Why? It binds to the binding site that ATP should bind to. So all your muscles will contract, but they can't do what? Release. Yep. Why anybody would do that on purpose? I have no idea. Give me my wrinkle. The first step is exposing actin's binding sites. When a muscle cell is stimulated, the action potential brings about the release of calcium ions from the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium ions flood into the cytosol and bind to the troponin, causing a change in conformation of the troponin-tropomyosin complex. This conformational change exposes the binding sites on actin. Click the terminal cisternae to start the process. When a binding site on actin is exposed, an energized myosin head can bind to it, forming a cross bridge. Click the energized cross bridge to begin the binding. So remember, from the last time this happened, we're holding on to that energy. So even though it's laying down and the muscle is relaxed, the myosin head is in its energized configuration. I hate technology sometimes. So you can pick up on page 21 on your own. Damn you, computer. Um, OK, so use this. We'll, I want you this weekend to go through this, understand this. Because on Tuesday, I am going to then review this quick. And everybody will understand exactly what I'm saying, correct? golf clubs and chain of pearls and the whole deal, right? Make sure you sign the sign-in sheet or you're not here. Have a lovely weekend.